three and a half years ago, my mother died. And um, when she died, it took her quite a while. And it was in a small town hospital. And so it turned into a kind of community vigil. It was kept during those six days. And a lot of things happened. And that's what this poem is all about. It's called In the Waiting Room. I have spent my life driving fast rigs across bad roads and sleeping with my head tucked up against vinyl armrests. I have spent my life waiting for someone to die. Floating past buttes and meditating jackrabbits, I memorize road signs and grieve in advance, fumbling for maps and cluttered glove compartments at 80 miles an hour on a gravel road. Life is branding me, balls in one hand and a hot iron in the other, the smell of burning hair, my puke on the ground, me in a cold sweat, too much heat, too much blood, too much sun, how much is too much war, not knowing at times just who got cut and branded, who crawled into the wrong chute, who got on the wrong end of whose rope. Leaning against cold chrome of a 69 jemmy in the dark, waiting for the cigarette to finish so that I can fire up that 283 with an overhead cam and drive towards where the sun cracks the horizon on the far side of the Yellowstone River. A man in love with the sound of dual glass packs. A man moving towards having it over with. My mother dies hard, back arched up almost off the bed. An outclass wrestler f fights being pinned every time she takes a breath for six days and six nights. Neighbors drop in to pay respects while she wrestles time. Some give their condolences and leave. Most stay for hours. A rotating vigil in the waiting room. Drinks weak coffee and eats coffee and cookie and cake. My father sits silently with his hands folded in his lap as he does at all social events, a man who is always waiting for it to be over with. Now that what I waited for for 25 years is happening, there are no surprises, except perhaps the irony of the painting at her bedside of an exquisite ballerina in full pirouette, and two neighbor women she, she always resented, who arrive with cookies and kind words to ask for time alone while my mother lies helpless and mute before her ancient enemy's relentless compassion. A cousin lives across the river with her carpenter husband and two children, lurks with her tears in the hall, unable to face the heaving spectacle of my mother's dying. In my arms for comfort, her body suddenly bucks and trembles, the shock of her tongue between my lips. I would have her flailing against the wall our mutual juices irrigating arid masonry, while the cat screams of incestuous lust conjure up hot blood in this place where it is more often sold stone cold. Now I yearn for cold chrome piercing the night, the flutter of those glass packs beneath my ass, for the leap of great horned owls into my headlights, while in the room behind our stillborn note of passion, a nurse weeps. My father looks up from his hands and says, well, we're wasting our time here. After my mother died, I spent, I spent a lot of time with my father in the past three and a half years, um, helping him, being a son to him, trying to be a son to him, and, and him going through a lot of grief, and, and me getting an opportunity to know him in some ways that I've never known him before. And that's what this next poem is about. It's titled Father. Put your foot down. Put your foot down again. Pick your foot up and put it down for 75 years on the same piece of ground. Break the ground. Spend day after day burning out your juices with an ax, a chain, and a short-legged mule, tearing out scrub brush in the river bottom. Dreaming of eyes, sometimes green and sometimes blue, gazing at your sweet, slick body, thrusting hard beneath the sky, while you waste the grace of youth's blossoming, 
on the passionless single eye of the sun. Pick your foot up, put your foot down, plant the ground. Wake into a night in late June and walk out. Walk alone down the side of the valley in the vibrating light of full moon into clear acres, now blossoming clover. Drifting perfume chokes unaccustomed nostrils. You spread arms, head arched back, twirling clumsily. Feet catch in the lushly spreading tendrils of alfalfa. Hear the whistle of the great northern train soaring from the base of the jagged valley wall across the river. Tone deaf, you have no place to pour your heart when the first coyote sings from the tree line. Cease your dervish whirl, stand firm again on the ground, and howl as the last seed of youth is spilled onto thirsty earth under the sweet, sweet clover. Pick your foot up, put your foot down. Pursue fading grass with hungry herefords, plow under the ghosts of the buffalo, drinks, drinks scalding coffee in the whispering shade of cotton crippled by the weight of the sky. Coffee brought first by a bride sitting easily astride an aging short-legged mule, later by a tense eleven-year-old son breaking his cherry and a 1954 deuce and a half. Wait for the weather year after year as though waiting for a hammer blow to fall on your back, and it does. Tender springs followed by no rain. High winds move the soil into coulee bottoms for days. Hailstorms blast the leaves off the trees, plow immature wheat back into stubble. A wife broken by too many deaths in a season sleeps through most meal times after reading strange, frightened letters written by oldest daughter from the bad badlands of New York City. Wake into the full moon in late October, hear the communal heartbeat of the wild geese as they find their way across the universe to your valley. Pick your foot up, put your foot down, wear a path from the living room to the kitchen and back, flick the lights on and off through the empty house, forced by the shocking absence of burden to speak your pain into the buzzing television screen and beg mother's forgiveness for the terrible sins which you must have driven her away to death. Finally soothed by a courtship photograph of you with leg cocked up on the running board of grandfather's 1939 Packard, an arm around a coquettish fiance who will be my mother, smiling at your side. You slide Gary Cooper's smirk towards the camera from beneath the immaculate Stetson and fall into restless sleep and recliner to the sound of the Star Spangled Banner. Oh say, can you see? <sighs> this next one's kind of a wild card. I saw a movie on Thelonious Monk, a documentary some time ago, and, and I was always fascinated by his music, but the, the documentary really fired my imagination and my, I think, compassion for the man. And this poem is, I guess, simply kind of a tribute to him. Thelonious, Thelonious Monk sings his song, mutters under his breath, stabs stiff-fingered at those black and whites loves his black woman and his white woman, one to watch his back and one to make him laugh, shuffles and twirls, chews and hews that pain down to a burnt over stump, still huge in the forest, which still somehow manages to laugh and cry without softening, without giving a goddamn inch through those black and whites, until finally even those fell silent. Prettier boys can weep for him, it would be easy, the pain slowed him down like brakes on an old steam engine. Those driving wheels would just lock up sometimes, but he never asked for anyone's tears, black or white. Just took his pain straight up, no chaser. He never saw that man bow down, even while he was sitting at that damn piano. He just slowed down now and then, like those old driving wheels, until he stopped. Years ago, I spent an interesting evening in the Port Authority bus nation. New York City, and uh, a lot of things were going on in my life at the time. It was kind of an interesting night, a difficult night in some way. Anyway, the poem is called Port Authority. The Buddha 
clown doesn't remember flying over water into Kennedy or falling asleep in the Port Authority bus station to be wakened by a whack on the sole of his shoe with a nightstick and told he can't sleep there with his eyes closed unless he has a ticket to ride. Even a painted man needs more than a banyan tree sometimes. Even he yearns to sleep with his eyes closed. Buddha knows that New York will kill him if he doesn't hustle. But he's so exhausted, so without destination or ambition, that he considers taking permanent refuge in the bus station to scavenge garbage cans, hustle spare change, and watch the silhouettes of legitimate travelers through half-closed eyelids from his plastic chair while practicing his half-hearted charade of someone with a place to go, someone with the right to sleep with their eyes closed. This place of giant cold stone does not sleep, but always keeps its ears and eyes closed to the street. Marble walls and plate glass muffle the sounds, diffuse and dim what little light manages to trickle down from the city's distant sky and shelter the Port Authority inhabitants from the sound of a thousand numb crotches battering one another against the back seats of demoralized checker cabs and from the sound of the rabbit screams and high shadows. Shielded from the betrayed dreams of the avenues, a sculptor's fingers cringe from the memory of clay within the folds and creases of a week old New York Times. A lover's thighs quiver against men's room porcelain, splattering tokens of passion onto the airbrushed loins of penthouse magazine. A failed salesman counts and recounts 36 paper and string wrapped packages he carries cradled in his arms as he gets on and off the buses, farting and belching as he goes. The Buddha seats himself in the cockpit of a pay television for a dollar's worth of black and white fantasy, but he gets more than he bargained for. As the tiny screen explodes to cover the entire wall with an overhead shot of a burning ambulance as it cruises across a burning bridge towards black clouds in the north. The, ca the camera moves inside where a jack of spades with a missing arm and half a missing face lies on a gurney, sheet thrown aside to reveal 36 sta staples winking silver light across his split open belly. He croaks hoarsely with a finger blocking his tracheal bypass. Here I am America, you fuckers. Here I am. Your fucking golden boy is back from your war, and don't try to change channels, assholes, because this is a McDonald's commercial, live on all channels. Just bring your dimes and quarters down to them golden arches in your Cadillacs, your fucking BMWs, and your fucking hippie vans, and eat your meat. As the gigantic picture shrinks and fades back to black and white, a red-haired woman seats herself in the chair next to the painted Buddha, she stares at the wall where the Golden Gate Bridge just disappeared. She trembles and flinches when the Buddha takes her hand, then holds tightly through the night without looking at his face, until dawn brings the vendors to the street markets, and he goes to buy his strung out Guinevere a garden fresh tomato, which she sinks gray teeth into, still avoiding his eyes, not even saying goodbye, when he steps aboard a dog with Omaha on its forehead. As the bus howls and wheels away from the loading dock, the Buddha clown looks back, hoping for a sign. But she is sleeping, sleeping with her eyes closed. Been a few times in my life when I have betrayed people, when I decided that my life was worth more than theirs. Uh, sometimes I, mean, I felt justified, but still. You define yourself by your actions, and it's interesting how to see yourself as someone who's cold enough or who is capable of turning away from somebody like that. And this poem, the poem is titled Lo Siento, which is Spanish for I'm sorry. And uh, the poem is an apology to a person whom I did turn away from and whose life I did decide was worth less than mine. The cavalier walks the stone back streets of Madrid in a silk shirt and tall boots of fine Moroccan leather. He lifts his face to bathe his scars in holy cathedral light and dreams of a black horse standing still in the shadows somewhere in the mountains above Palencia. Dreams of withered rose blossoms fluttering down from a Roman bridge silhouetted against the sky. The cavalier 
plays Russian roulette before a shaving mirror, grinds his teeth into cafe crystal, smiles blood onto the flawless neck of his Andalusian whore, and walks until the smoking fingers of the gypsy fires reach up to steal gold from the first light of dawn, walks in search of someone to stand vigil as ancient rose petals come to rest in dark water. I come from eastern Montana, and, 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 and uh, my first love of, of the land comes from that part of the country, and still does. And one of the things about that the country, the Badlands, uh, the river bottoms, where I grew up, is that I always had this, from a relatively early age, it always, the country always seemed so sensual to me. There was, in, in a lot of ways, and. Uh, this poem is really kind of testimony, I suppose, to that perception of that country. It's called uh, Rejuvenation. There is a black bridge across slow water with twin towers against blue sky. Two hawks circle over a train approaching from the south, veering off when the bridge begins to vibrate with the slow rumble of the great northern engine into its, into, sorry, into its steel ribs. Tandem predators soar upriver, feathers hum in the thermals rising from baked earth and stone. The shadows skim over a shallow coulee, which shelters with struggling elms the remnants of a cattle ranch headquarters, whose saddle leather creaks only in the memories of a few ancient cowboys still propped up against local cigarette-scarred bars. Two figures walk without shadow down from the yellow-brown divide. Scorched buffalo grass rustles beneath their feet as they sidestep the occasional ground cactus without losing their grunt, the languid rhythm. Sweat trickles down his bare inner arm, circles around through sun-kissed golden hairs to slide onto her smaller Mediterranean hand. The man moves as though he knows the ground guides his companion down into the coulee to the frayed shadows of the elms, where the two lovers turn slowly into one another under the scrutiny of the abandoned old ranch house, where it bleeds its ancient tin siding into the dirt. Mouths probe, seal, seek more moisture, more flesh, they fall to earth. Breasts float loose, scarcely noticed, wet panties and dusty blue jeans yanked aside. As if from drowning, she pulls herself up onto all fours. He thrusts from behind, lifts her knees from the ground. Her cry flies out to join the screaming hawk overhead. But the man does not hear, he cannot see, for all of his universe is at their joining, and they are adrift among roiling seas of buffalo grass. The sun staggers over the heads of the two lovers, propelling themselves in the wake of the tin-covered shack until the storm subsides, their body-sweet liquid spilling from their thighs to irrigate the dying grass beneath. Long after the two lovers abandon their harsh bed, long after the woman kisses the anointed spot goodbye, long after the hawks remove their vigil, the bleeding shack remains, leans wide-eyed against the sky, waits for something green to grow. And um, this poem is, again, about that country and growing up out there. And somehow, the, at least the apparent conflict or contradiction between the country itself and some of the things that went on in the country, the people things. It's called the nightlife. Tumbleweeds ride at dust squalls crest along Highway 2. The shadows of resurrected buffalo briefly scamper in the headlights of the 1949 Ford, pacing a jackrabbit's nocturnal patrol in the borrow pit as a crazed disc jockey comes in on KOMA from Oklahoma City, spurring his failing electronic bronc onto the Canadian line. The dark red Ford comes up on the crest of a steep ridge, its high beams shoot out as if to join the northern lights. 
behind the tattered curtain of a sky running before the Ford's thunder and the rank dust of the ghost buffalo herd, carrying an adolescent heart through the scent of shattered stage, sagebrush towards beaded eagle feather dancing on a perfect wind. The, Tony, the boy keeps his Tony Llamas thrust deep in the trembling heart of the Ford souped up flathead V8 as it screams over the last granite blasted hill towards a sparkle of cheap jewelry on black velvet. He downshifts, watching the tachometer needle dance on the red line until the glass packs mutter in brief orbit with gleaming chrome and red glowing dragons under the faltering neon of a high plains roadhouse on Saturday night. While inside, two immaculate cowboys drag Ray Price backwards through swinging doors into the club lounge. His silver sheathed boot heels bump along a cigarette littered floor to the stage where they prop him up on two dead mics to sing through twenty years of road whiskey and lucky strikes. The nightlife ain't no good life, but it's my life. This is the last poem. It's kind of a celebration in a lot of ways of a lot of miles that I put on over a lot of years traveling, hitchhiking. And, uh, this was a good trip. It's called Road Dog. A good tailwind and a red roadrunner carry me in holy smoke from the Thanksgiving fiddles and wine of Mountain Pine, Arkansas through sunshine and little soft rain across Oklahoma on Highway 40 to Flagstaff, Arizona in a foot of fresh snow, with me turning north towards the San Juans and Colbank Hill. I move along the broken shoulder of Highway 89 towards the outskirts of Flagstaff and the San Francisco mountains beyond, lifting my feet high to clear the snowdrifts, since the only cleared space is where the 18 wheelers roll, and I am not inclined to replace some poor trucker's daydream of a down payment on New Kenworth, with a nightmare of my scattered body and backpack to take home on the turnaround to his wife in some Glory B. Taylor Court outside of Sacramento. The radio in my last ride said storm fronts coming and going all the way up the Rocky Mountain front into Canada, but I'm warm and clear in my Air Force survival parka with a coyote fur trimmed hood blessed by Buddha and a $20 bill folded in my sock until outside an abandoned Conoco station on the edge of town, a stray dog, some kind of shepherd mix, decides that whether I go, she will go, and proceeds to do so. However, she refuses to walk in the deep snow with me, preferring to stay in the snow-packed roadway, from which she leaps for life each time a vehicle rips by. Horrified, I try to get her to forsake the path of her passion, but I fail and she's finally nailed, by an old twin-screw Dodge cattle truck with local plates. The driver does not turn his ruined Stetson nor even slow down, but I do, and what I see is not nearly as pretty as it is final. Without pause for a requiem, for a dog whose only crime was to love without keeping her eye on the white line, I head up Cedar Wash towards a town called Mexican Water. Thank you.
This one is a, uh, this next one's an adaptation of a, of a coastal Salish story about sucker. And uh, I, what, I, what I liked in this poem was just the way the, the uh, Lachute seed uh, people uh, saw value in the sucker, that, that fish that's considered a trash fish by us. And I, I got permission from the woman whose father told her this story to write this and publish it. I did, and I'd written it, I sent it to her and said, you know, how are you comfortable with this? And she said, great, you know, I'm really glad that you reworked Dad's old story, you know, so. Sucker. It was in the story about the journey to the sky, the one where ripe salmon berries grab the canoe maker and take him right up, just as he's reaching to pick them. Watch what you grab, it might grab you. Like just ripe berries can grab in the guts, the old people say. Everybody, animals, fish, birds, went up in the sky to look for him, this canoe maker who got grabbed by the salmon berries. It was a stampede to get back down the sky ladder after they found him. It broke under the weight of the big animals going first, black bear, grizzly bear, elk, and others and stranded a lot of people up there in the sky. Sucker was an Indian doctor then. He was stranded up there with the others. Don't be afraid, he told them, and to get on his back. Then he jumped. He brought everyone down from the sky. That's why he has bones of all shapes in him. Eagle, wolf, fish, hawk, blue jay, and lots of others. His head was not solid. The old ones could name every bone in Sucker's head and tell what animal it had come from when he jumped down with them all on his back. Sometimes it's good to have a head that isn't solid, like Sucker. You will find him rotting along the riverbanks in our country, too bony. But you Lushutseed people, you learned his secret. You did, a whole taxonomy there in his soft head. Sucker was an Indian doctor then. You learned the bones of all the animals from Sucker's head. You did. This is a little change of pace. I, uh, I had a close friend die of AIDS. It'd be two years in May. And uh, two or three months before he died, we'd gone up into the hills near the Mission Mountains to a frozen lake and sat on the bank of this lake on a blindingly brilliant sunlit day with the light just pouring off the surface of the lake. And uh, I wrote this poem for him uh, that day. It's called The White Lake. It's for Henry, 38, facing death from AIDS. We sit blinded by light off the frozen lake. I make snow goggles of my fingers. Does it work? Yeah, there's just a little band of light, like peering out through narrow slits. Perhaps it's the closeness, you say. There is blood mixed with moisture in your right nostril. I don't think about it the way I used to. I don't think it's a failure when I die. We mentioned the baby otter your wife saved from the dogs. How still it lay in its dark fish tank shelter when we touched it. I rub your shoulder bony beneath your handsome sweater. We sit together on the bank of the white lake. We peer out through our hands, narrow slits at the blinding light. This next one's a little poem I wrote for Frenchtown Pond, which is a place I swim often in the summer and uh, people disdain it because it's right there along the freeway and they think it's scummy, but it's uh, spring-fed from the bottom. 
and cool and, and uh, the osprey fish there and, and uh, in the evenings often I'll see osprey fishing in French Town Pond while I'm swimming. It's a uh, wonderful time and it's just called water wings. A pair of ospreys fish French Town Pond where I paddle the reedy water and children push each off the swimmer's raft. They cruise with loose, flapping motions, hover, drop into the pond, flop about, ascend, shake themselves like wet dogs in the light-filled air, fishing late on a summer's day eight, nine times into the cool water. They catch no fish, these master fishers, nor seem concerned. Lazy they seem almost, out for an evening swim. Feathers and sinew weave air and water together, the blazing sun and the cool springs. We've swimmer to sky in the savage light. A stout breeze scallops the surface while the children, astride each other's shoulders, plunge, shouting, into the reedy depths. I'll read a couple of more now that are, are not necessarily water poems. Those are all water poems because we're here on the water and we're at a place which is important to me. Uh, but I want to I want to read a poem for Anaconda, Montana, and uh, it's called uh, Anaconda Almost Making It, and it's for my dear dear friend Ed Leahy. Um, we might have to do that intro. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to do a couple now that aren't necessarily uh, water poems. And um, this first one is uh, called Anaconda, Almost Making It. It's from my dear, dear friend Ed Leahy, uh, without whom I don't know whether I'd even be sane today or not. Uh, Almost Making It, Anaconda. Bread. The whole town is Serbs or Croats, smeltermen who didn't like to work underground. Your house is a small bathtub, so we swim at the hot springs. You ply me with coconut oil, the real thing for deep tanning, and stories of almost making it. That Ford tri motor was coming into land after spraying for pine beetles. His landing gear snagged on a phone wire. He felt it instantly, throttled all three motors wide open. It startled me to hear those big engines open up. I thought he was going to make it. He must have been dragging a thousand feet of wire. It wrapped around a pole and he nosedived right into the ground. My heart was going thump, a thump, a thump. He had five kids. We end up red as strawberries. The coconut oil has no sunblock. But your baked chicken has plenty of garlic. And the spring water below the road is sweet. He is parked there, his woman next to him in the old Ford, big engines idling. I hear this spring has pure water. It tastes pretty good, he says swallowing another mouthful of dusk. I wonder where his five kids, the two next to me, eating popcorn from a paper sack. This second one is uh, also a poem that's got a big Ed presence in it. It's called Flicker. Too fast in my blue earth Ford, I strike a low-flying flicker, bring it home in a pocket. I see your orange ribbed feathers, sun spotted along the edge. I hear your black throat call darkness to your breast, claws sharp as a cat's. See your turned off eyes, flecks of obsidian liquid. I see the red back gash where your jaws meet, and soft, black-striped feathers cloaking your powerful shoulders. Ed speaks of your persistence, 
He nailed a piece of tin over your hole in his roof. You made another just above it, which he nailed over with a piece of tin. You made another just above it, which he nailed over and over and over, holes and tin, until you both ran out of roof. No heart to peck or nail the sky. This story of your persistence, too. No fair exchange for your hollow bones against my grill. White rump feathers flashing the mind. Sure great to have those geese this morning on this uh, video. I hope we're picking them up. That'd be wonderful. I want to do a, uh, maybe just a couple more here. We'll see. Uh, this one's a huckleberry picking poem. And, um, it's for my favorite aunt, my mother's older sister, who was a wonderful uh, person in my growing up. And I've done a lot of huckleberry picking here in Montana, uh, especially with my friend Francis Vanderberg and, uh, and my old companion, Eleanor Donish. So I, uh, uh, it's an activity that is uh, it's probably not altogether different than weaving one of those activities that's meditative and, and calming and good to be doing uh, for people who are pickers. There are people who are pickers and who like doing that. I, I uh, uh, know a woman here in town, Ruth Ledoux is her name, who uh, grew up 60 years ago in the woods in Montana, and, and she talks a lot about how she loved to pick. She loved to be out just picking. And she gave away most of what she picked. It wasn't just to get the berries. It was the activity itself of picking. I think it's a kind of activity that we don't value uh, as much as I, as much as I'd like to. I'm trying to learn to value that stuff more all the time. Anyway, <laughs> huckleberry picking. It's for Eleanor and uh, my aunt Nina. The mountain is cool. The berries dark red. Some years, strange pickers clean them out, but you know other patches, more hidden. We take Nina's large Japanese binoculars from their beat up case. You tell me the berries will stain it. Good. She watched squirrels in the Michigan oaks. Oaks, old ant strapped to the bed now. Food tubes up her nostrils. She's torn out many times. Her hands are tied down now, laced into big mittens. Ours learn from these berries tiny, quick movements, gentle, so as not to crush. Each huckleberry has a tornado in it, on top where the little circle is, Jack says, and they get your hands all inky. Jocko strips whole bushes into his mouth, like a bear, and eats from Jack's pail, like eating yellow jackets in September, mm, 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 mm. snapping his jaws as fast as they bite. No wonder his tongue is black. I know we'll see a bear tonight, you say, driving up. Some stumps almost are bear. But bear is in the berries. You picking up that something in the air means ripe huckles, same as bear. But there are no bears since the power line went through. The berries can rot on the bushes now. We pick the binocular case full. Nighthawk sounds like a car putting its brakes on, only in the air. Yarrow blooms the center of the road. Yarrow and yarrow and yarrow. Moonflower in the near dark. Coming down 11 p.m., sunset glow still way out west. You hand me a Pepsi and fall asleep against me. A young buck in velvet in a mighty big hurry wakes you. Jack with Jocko eats most of his in the back seat, goes straight to bed, sleepy head. We do up the dishes, eat berries and cream, freeze some, sleep well, small stains in the leather case. And Nina, she knows other patches, more hidden. Each berry has a tornado in it. Her hands still learn tiny, quick movements, gentle so as not to crush.
Let's do one more Barry uh, poem. Uh, this is a very recent poem, and I wrote this up on TV Mountain. Uh, I think, yeah, that away from here, <laughs> behind that screen of trees, uh, where in the early 70s I, I built a house up there. My uh, uh, companion of the time and her father and my good friend Mike Kreisberg and I. And that was great, uh, uh, building a house and learning all about that. And, uh, then walked away from it one spring day and hardly ever go back. Anyway, uh, this poem's called Snowberries. And it's from a night I spent up on that mountain uh, last August. Just thought I'd go up and spend a night sleeping out by myself. Snowberries. One stem of grass rises above the bushes like a flame. Like a young pine quietly grazes the sky. An old story says our God killed a man for this, spilling his seed on the ground. Look around. There are other gods here. A young bear ambles through the brush and magically gone. A wasp harvesting the wealth of the bear's droppings permits you to bend down close enough almost to touch the faint odor of exhausted berries, whole white ones like fat stars in the dark scats. You wander the afternoon away, free a young aspen that has caught its crotch in the branch of a bush that will split it apart as it grows, and watch a couple of bats bring the stars out. You sleep, fall on your side, raise your hand easily to Orion's thigh. The Pleiades splitting his heart ahead of him like owls hooing in the ripe dark mass of night. Oh, sure, sure. I didn't know whether that would be in the uh, shot or not. The hat's okay, isn't it? Yeah. I kind of like having my hat there. <laughs> Maybe I'll even put it right, right there. Okay, whenever you're ready. All right, this next poem is called Lion Moon, and it's just, uh, it was my, I, you know, I'd never seen a lion, you know, out in the woods, and I was feeling disappointed, and this was Christmas Eve two years ago, just boom, right up out of the snow. Lion Moon, up past squatters camps, tin cans, black plastic and smoke, half a piece of ivory roaring in the sky, admire Sleeping Woman Mountain, framed by trees where a red fox eats. Tired of words, tie your blue woolen shirt around your waist. A lion explodes silence from snow into sun nearly brushing the ridge. Its bushy tail curved longer than its body, thicker than your wrist, switches uphill and disappears into Christmas Eve. Two giant blasted ponderosas remember fire. Look back at a flock of birds. The moon is pouring ivory from a lavender sky. Watch darkness come down her curved and bushy tail. Watch darkness framed by trees where a red fox eats. Next one I want to do is a uh, poem for an eagle. Next I'm doing a lion poem, an eagle poem, and a badger poem. So I'll be doing three real powerful creature poems here. And this was an eagle that didn't make it. Like that almost making it poem of the airplane crashing. Uh, well, this is an eagle uh, in trouble as well. And it's for Rick Yates, who was a student of mine. I don't even know where he is anymore. Uh, guy I loved. Hope he's out there doing good. This is for you, Rick. News from the park. One, the janitor's broom sweeping the floor near the freezer knocks out the electric plug. Everything rots. They set it outside, plug it back in. The lion's skin, the skulls of bear, weasel, and elk whole carcasses of hawk freeze again into a solid cube of slush. Riley and you salvage what you can. The most of it, though, goes to the county dump. 
And you know what else? We found the stomach of that bear ate those two girls back in 67. It's out on the dump right now with the gophers and crows. The contents of that bear's stomach, two young women mixed with salmon and berries, victims of the janitor's brush, sweeping, sweeping the dust, the broken leaves and dead matches, an accident of nature, our nature. Two, accidents of nature. The leg of a young eagle dislocated in the nest, probably stepped on. You'd watched it from before they copulated, watched them line the nest with moss and down. And when she fledges, the only one this year, you watch her crash land in the trees. You catch fish to feed her, standing on her one good leg, the other twisted up against the breast. Finally, you send her to the Raptor Clinic in Minneapolis. They destroy her, freeze the body. No way to fix, they say. It grew along the lines of dislocation. We find her thawing on the dissecting table amidst vats filled with animal skulls from which the African beetles devour every scrap of flesh, suck even the fat from the pores of the bones. Her light leg is twisted up against her body and broken for examination at the joint. You snip off the metal band you placed on the good leg, climbing half a day to that great nest. Mishkin's gone, you say, as we walk out into the soft January slush. Three. I tell you, I saw a one-legged crow hopping in the street the day before Christmas, sweeping, sweeping the sun back home with its black feather wings. I hope, you say, a one-legged crow eats those girls rotten in the belly of the bear, sweeping, sweeping the sun back home, black feather wings. This is a badger poem, and it was written for my son Jack when he was a wee boy. And we lived down by Clark Fork, down by McCormick Park. There was badger in the yard. It was a great day. Badger for da Jack. You come same day as great grandmother Neil from Arkansas to shuck apricots in August. You come in the morning, swelled up and snarling at the dog. We call the dog catcher. You show his little noose on a stick, your best teeth, your sharp hiss. You know he's probably hurt. A tranquilizer gun couldn't get through that thick skin. We'll have to shoot him. I don't aim to get bit, so he calls the cops. You lift your head, your painted face, to sniff our voices. Circles of white fur around the eyes, the nose, your striped forehead. Face of raccoon panda, face of possum all at once. Before O'Gara comes, we call his tranquilizer gun. You burly stalk across the garden, turn from your hole to stare. That white marked face, then fine earth flying. O'Gara too late, teases his helper about reaching in. Oh, you've got both your thumbs. Guess you can spare one. He pokes in the handle of the hole. Badgers aren't as ferocious as people think. Back in the depression when a badger skin was worth some money, my dad and I saw one crossing the road. I took off after him. He was digging down a ground squirrel hole. I pulled him out by his hind legs, him twisting and turning like chubby checker to get at my wrists. Making noise would put a grizzly to shame. Made a believer out of me. Dad ran up and beat him to death with the crank for starting the car. He asks how big you are, how much dope to load in his gun. He sure digs like he's big, says the man with two thumbs. I wonder if the dog bit you. It takes some dog 
They'll crush a dog's foot. Just take it in their mouth and bear down, crush all the bones. They're strictly carnivorous, ground squirrels, gophers, mice. Oh, once in a while you'll hear one got a small fawn before it could run. They're a big weasel. O'Gara comes too late to risk his partner's thumbs. <laughs> too late to blast you full of dope. As he scales the picket fence, we tell of your beautiful face. If they have a pretty face, must be female, he laughs. You stay two days in cool soil under the shed, pretty face, then gone through a big new hole. Animals that stay up all night are like trees that stay green all winter. White fur circles your eyes, your nose, pretty face. It'd take some dog. This last one I want to read uh, this, uh, in this animal sequence is um, a poem I wrote for Chuck Jonkel. I, I went to the Arctic with Chuck about nearly 10 years ago now. And um, this is uh, derived from that uh, trip. It's called The Bear Remembers, and it's for Chuck. It opens with a quote out of a, uh, the book by uh, very Lopez called Arctic Dreams, which I read on the train up and back. Quote, in 1818, two ships under Sir John Ross met with polar Eskimos on the Greenland coast. One of the Eskimos turned to the Isabella, one of the ships, and asked, who are you? What are you? Where do you come from? Is it from the sun or the moon? The polar bear, actually black-skinned, holds a piece of ice in front of her nose while stalking a seal. One time, she rolls a flat, round rock into your trap, springing it, then eats the bait. Possibly not accidental behavior, your official report says. So afraid is our science of intelligence in these bears. The Eskimo carving tells an old story that bears who approach a man with only a stick for protection will not attack. And Gusuksuk forgets. As the bear comes toward him, he kneels on the ice and prays. The bear wonders what the man is doing. Nose to nose, almost, she turns her head, wondering at the man. No one is willing to risk this old story of Bear's memory. You and a government chopper shoot her with tranking drugs. She runs into a cold lake, begins to sleep and drown. You hold up her head with a stick. She still tries to bite. When she finally sleeps, you drag her huge drugged body out on a pole slide and ashore, take her milk, her blood, one tooth, leave a blue number tattooed into the gum of her upper jaw. You stay with her two days until fully herself again, you holding her head, drowsy above the water, a man with only a stick. You come to a place where a bear, patiently waiting for a seal, has bored a hole two inches into the ice. Heat from her heart to her wide anus. Her tracks rush the seal, the food that counts, little marbles of snow forced out of the kill place by impact. I stick my head all the way into the snow print of her paw silence like inside the igloo during a storm and yet this large bear sits on the churchill town dump eating the battery from a junk car who are we where do we come from is it from the sun or the moon 
the land is a kind of knowledge traveling in time through us. The bear does not forget. Okay, I want to read a, a uh, I guess this will be a final poem. And um, one of the most powerful uh, things that's happened to me in the last several years is the, I spent half a year in China as a teacher in 91, and I nearly died there, but I, I, uh, I had pneumonia and was in a Chinese hospital, etc. But I, 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 something happened between me and the Chinese, and uh, uh, I can't finish this reading without acknowledging the power and the importance of that uh, uh, time in China and, and working with that language and, and linking with that culture and, and those people on me. And I have good Chinese friends there and here now. And this is a just a poem I wrote to one of the women who had uh, lost a baby she'd miscarried. And it's called Geranium. And it, and it takes us from this wonderful natural world back to the center of town. And, and the town I lived in in, Shanghai, in China was Shanghai, which was like 13 to 15 million people, depending on how many came into the town every day from the surrounding countryside. And, and uh, I always try to think when I'm out in a place like this about the time uh, in the streets of Shanghai where 60% of the life takes place in the street. I mean, it's, and the buses are so crowded that literally they hire packers. The bus company hires packers to pack people in the bus when you can no longer get any more in. A great big Chinese guy standing on the platform will physically pack another 12 or 15 people on the bus. And I remember the first time I was packed, I had a sack of tangerines in one hand and a loaf of bread in the other. And as he jammed me in and the bread crushed and the tangerines juiced, he laughed. And I laughed. I like to remember that when I'm out here in this kind of space that we have in Montana. Anyway, this is just geranium, and it's for Jihua. Because three years from China, you still know the name of this flower because your father planted it. Because your daughter sits on her teacher's grandmother each time she plays the piano, because her picture is inside the bench. And because she has painted the eye of a blue jay, like the insides of a green jar. Because you lost him, barely half a pound of your flesh, and his body turned black from his own blood and from yours. Because his miniature toes printed perfect black whorls onto white paper. And because he was all there, I bring you this flower Shi La Hong, this stone waxy red geranium. That's it. Nice to be out here with you, Kathleen, making this film with these geese <laughs> and this river and these sky and these old cottonwood logs. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. Get this red against the gold. It's really yeah. nice. I hammed around on it, didn't I? Yeah, it was great. Was it? You think? The band-aid on your thumb was so funny. <laughs> he still has his thumb, so I hope. <laughs> that was hilarious. Great, great. <laughs> don't edit that stuff out. I mean, if, it, oh, yeah. if it's a little goofy or clowny or something, that'll be fun. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think we ought to be super serious. Nah. Oh.
It's poetry, the great church of poetry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that is. Yeah, well, it gets, it's a pain in the ass, is what it is. <laughs> it's got to be fun. Well, these geese have been just a terrific presence, and we're going to have some geese sounds, aren't we? Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, it's been just great. Mm -hmm. And the, I don't know if you'll we'll hear the river, but we heard it today, whether or not. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you all here tonight. I hope uh, there aren't too many people that heard me over at the library a couple hours ago. I'm going to do the same uh, thing that I did at the library, so I don't want you guys to be disappointed. Um, the piece I'm going to start with, I'm actually only going to do two pieces tonight. Uh, one is a story that's going to take 10 to 15 minutes, and the other one's like a long prose poem. And uh, I, I'm just now starting to work with prose, just starting to move into the story form, so this is brand new. And I was telling people I finished this one this morning at, at about 12 o'clock, you know, so it's uh, brand new, and it's uh, it's about growing up on a farm in Michigan when I'm about six or seven years old. It's called Babe. When I was six years old, we moved to the farm near Battle Creek. The war was on and I had only one dream. I wanted to fly. The P-51 Mustang was my plane. The airfield at Fort Custer was only a couple of miles off and my brother and I would climb the old windmill and lay up there on the wooden platform above the roof and watch the planes taking off and landing. One day when my mother and I were home alone, a strange gray car, a dusty Hudson, pulled into the drive, and a small man with a decided limp made his way up the walk to our door. Mrs. Dunsmore? Yes. Yes. I'm Vera Dunsmore. Mom and I stayed behind the screen door. My name's Jerry, Jerry Frame. I work at the airplane engine factory. I've got a special horse I brought all the way from Arizona when I came up here, and I need a place to pasture her. I've been told your farm would be good. I have a dead sister. I talked to her through a medium. She's the one who guided me to your place. There's a long pause. <laughs> I'll have to ask my husband. Check back in a day or two. Okay, I'll check back. Thank you for considering it, Mrs. Dunsmore. He limped back to his car. Mom and I went back to canning peaches or applesauce or whatever else it was we were doing in the kitchen. We didn't talk about it, the request of this stranger but I'm sure Dad won't go for it. We're strict Methodists, 